hey, we don't have time to review much today <laughs> because there's so much to talk about, but we are going to go back and cover some of the things about the great white throne judgment. So in the millennial reign, we've had Jesus has come back. The battle of Armageddon has taken place. The marriage supper of the lamb has taken place. There are 75 days unaccounted for. Um, that are mentioned by Daniel in his prophecy of the 70th week when he tells the um, timeline there's he says blessed is he who attains to the 1290 days and then the 13 and 35 days so we have a 30 day period and then we have a 75 day period and we don't know what happens during that time but we believe that it's the marriage supper of the lamb the sheep and goat judgment, and then the restoration of the earth. Because during the thousand year reign, the earth will be a flat plain except for Jerusalem, which will be on a mountain. And we do see mountains and hills mentioned. So there will be others, but Jerusalem will be the highest. So it's gonna, the whole earth is gonna look different during the thousand year reign. And it's gonna return to paradise like the Garden of Eden. And we're also going to see where the animals don't kill each other anymore. Um, but there, there are still animal sacrifices in the millennial temple. So there will be a temple built there. It will not be. Some commentators speculate about the temple that's going to be rebuilt during the tribulation, saying that it's going to be the same one in the millennium. And there's no way. When I, when I look at the details, there's just no way. Um, Jesus is going to build the temple in the thousand-year reign. Israelites are going to build it during the tribulation. The one during the thousand-year reign is very, very different than the one in the Old Testament. It's magnificent. It's a whole lot bigger. There's a whole lot more to it. Um, and we don't understand all the symbolism of everything that's in that millennial temple. So it's not going to be the same one. It will be a different one. Everything is going to be destroyed at Jesus' second coming. Remember, I mean, through the wrath of God, those last three and a half years, every mountain crumbles, every island flees away, this, all the stars fall from heaven. Everything is going to be different. So Jesus is going to restore the earth during the thousand year reign. Okay, now the great white throne judgment. That's where we left off last time. We jumped, we did a, um, we covered the thousand year reign. At the end of the thousand year reign, Satan is going to be released from his pit. Yeah, everybody always asks me, <laughs> Why? Time, could you, yeah, could you just go ahead and put it in the lake of fire with the Antichrist and the false prophet? But God's plan is that he's going to be released for a short time. He will go out and deceive the nations. He will be successful in deceiving the nations, which is crazy. Because think about what the nations have seen. They've seen Jesus himself walking on the earth. They've seen the restoration of all things. They see us in our glorified bodies with our testimony of what it used to be like and what it's like now. And, and yet they choose to go to war with God. So they allow themselves to be deceived. God destroys them with fire Satan is then cast into the lake of fire with the Antichrist and the false prophet. They're the only ones there right now in the lake of fire. Um, then the second resurrection takes place. That is the resurrection of all the dead since Adam. So they'll all be resurrected with new bodies. Just like we get new bodies at the rapture, they will get their eternal bodies at that second resurrection. They will stand before the great white throne judgment. I'm not sure where the, the great white throne is. I don't know if everyone, I don't know if the, 
the throne comes down, if it's in the temple, or if everyone, you know, he, he destroyed them with fire, was the earth destroyed with fire, and then we all go to heaven. I don't know where that judgment is. It's not clear in scripture. It just says, um, then they went to the great white throne judgment. They stood before the great white throne. <coughs> then heaven and earth passes away and books are opened. So this has to be in some spiritual realm. This has to be in a heavenly realm. Um, the books are open. The dead, which are all the lost, are judged by what is written in the books, just like we are. There are books of deeds, and our works are judged. And if they don't burn up, then they remain, and there's an eternal reward. So the books, book of deeds are open for them as well, and they are judged by their deeds. And then the book of life is opened, and if their name is not found in the book of life, they are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the end of evil. The, this is the end of it. So if you think about during the thousand year reign, do you remember what happened to Babylon during the tribulation? It was gone. It was destroyed. And if you read the book of Isaiah, it says that it becomes a prison for every wicked thing. So all those demons that have no place to rest, they're half human, half, they're the offspring of half human, half angel. They are imprisoned in Babylon during the thousand year reign. So at this point, they're thrown into the lake of fire with death, with Hades, with Satan, with all the fallen angels, all wickedness is thrown into the lake of fire. This was the chart that is in your book. And we went over it pretty much last week and showed where all the unbelievers and where all the believers in history are. At this point, in the great white throne judgment, we are there. We're witnesses. But God is judge. And the books are open and they're um, judged according to their deeds. And we think that there are rewards in hell just like there are rewards in heaven. Some are not going to have it quite as hot as others. But it is eternal separation from God. The body never dies. It is eternal torment for anyone who rejects God. Any questions about where everybody is right now? The only people left are all around the, the great white throne as witnesses, and that is the earthly survivors, believers of the millennial reign in their human bodies, and then the bride of Christ in their spiritual bodies. That's all that's left right now. Okay, so that brings us to Revelation 21. Does anyone have any questions so far about where we are up to the Great White Throne Judgment? It, yes? It says about Jesus creating a temple, but didn't it say that there is no temple because Jesus is the temple? I mean, That's the New Jerusalem. So then what temple are you talking about? I'm talking about the Millennial Temple. There will be, uh, when Jesus restores the earth, at the beginning of the thousand year reign, there will be a temple. There will be a throne. David, King David will sit on the throne and be a prince of Israel, but Jesus is the ultimate King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he will set up governments. He will divide the world and all these survivors who then begin to multiply and be fruitful, um, they will be workers and leaders in the nation. I mean, it's like God starts all over with a small remnant from the tribulation. And I don't know if you remember last week, I showed you the, a picture of the Millennial Temple. It's very modern in appearance. We looked at that temple. Uh, the Israelites will bring their sacrifices into it. 
that's where we will serve as kings and priests to, um, to Jesus at that temple. And then at the end, when the earth is destroyed, that temple goes away. And then the new Jerusalem comes down. The new heaven and new earth and the new Jerusalem, the new city come down and there's no temple in that city. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, verse 1, chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Now there's that word sea again, and we've seen it used over and over and over in the book of Revelation. And the word, um, let's look at, let's break down verse 1. Then. The word then, I put those orange brackets around because it marks a time on the timeline. That, so after the great white throne judgment, John sees a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, what does that mean? New means fresh. It comes from the Greek word kanos, and it means new or fresh. Heaven, we know what heaven is. It's the air, the sky, the third heaven, and then the earth is the land. The, the country and it comes from the word ye and that's where we get geo our word for geography the first had passed away the word is pro and it means first in line so in the beginning God created the heaven and earth that was the first and it passes away um, it has already really been destroyed but God renewed it, refreshed it during the thousand year reign and it, now it's gone um, it's passed away it means it withdrew, it departed, it's gone then C the word C is uh, Thalassa and in Ezekiel 122 there's this interesting, this is a vision that Ezekiel had of the throne room of God and this is something new that I discovered this week, and it's just fascinated me. Now, over the heads of the living beings, there was something like an expanse, like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward the other. Each one also had two wings covering its body on the one side and on the other. Now, above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance. And on that, which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of man. So in this vision, it's like there's a crystal sea over the heads of the living creatures. So you have the throne, and if you look at that picture, you see a artist rendition of this. You see the throne of God with someone with the appearance of a man sitting on the throne, the four living creatures around the throne, and that's the same as what we had in Revelation. But in Ezekiel, the sea, the crystal glassy sea expanse was above the living creatures. It was between, it was their ceiling. And it served as a floor of the throne. Well, that's different than Revelation. So in Ezekiel, there's the best I could do to kind of show you what it looked like. God was on the glassy sea no one could approach his presence. They could see his presence. They were in his presence, near his presence, but they were separated by this glass ceiling. I want you to think about that term, glass ceiling. In what way have you heard that in modern political terms? And what, what are they trying to? to do. People who mentioned the glass ceiling. They're trying to shatter it. Which is interesting to me. I went, what are they really trying to shatter? Is it just a political thing? Is it just a um, is it just an income thing? You know, there's a glass ceiling for women. Men have all these other opportunities and there's a glass ceiling for women. They can only go so far. They can't get any higher. 
and I want to shatter the glass ceiling. And I thought, is there something a little bit more cynical and wicked here? Is this uh, kind of like the Tower of Babel trying to reach God um, by building the big tower? Is trying to shatter the glass ceiling, trying to get to the throne of God? And it's there for our protection. It's there for our protection because we can't be in His presence without holiness and purity. We can't approach. So in the Old Testament, nobody could get to the throne. They could see it, but they couldn't get to it. In Revelation four, the New Testament saints are seated on thrones around the thrones with the four living elders. He said the four living elders were around the throne, and then. The 24, I mean, the living creatures are around the throne, then the 24 elders, which is us, and then the angels of heaven were around us. But then here come the 144,000, and the tribulation saints are also there in that crowd, in that multitude. And so they're standing on, um, the tribulation saints were standing on the sea of glass before his throne. So now, be, I wonder if this is a, a symbol of the veil being torn in the temple. Remember the old temple when Jesus died on the cross? The veil in the temple was torn in two. And now everyone who commits their life to Jesus has access into the Holy of Holies, into the throne room of God without fear. We can boldly approach the throne of grace of God without fear. So I wonder if that veil was a picture, you know, everything in the temple or the tabernacle was a pattern of what Moses saw in heaven. So was the veil symbolic of the crystal sea and that it, it shattered. I think that, I think the crystal sea moved um, at this time. And now we all have access to the very throne of God. As a matter of fact, we're seated with Christ. When the curtain tore, what? Did the, sea move? did the sea move? I believe it did. I believe at that moment, the sea moved. Okay, so in Ezekiel 122, when you look at that word expanse, it's rakia, and it's an extended sur a surface. And it says an ex it's an expanse like crystal, so it's like glass. The word crystal means frost or ice, so it's clear. Um, so you see in the notes I put, it is possible that no one could approach the holiness of God. You could be in his presence, but you were separated by glass, by this expanse of crystal. Exodus 24, 9. This is when Moses went up the mountain with Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch his hand out against the nobles of the sons of Israel. And they saw God, and they ate and drank. Is this, and that's why I wrote, is this what the veil that separated the priests from God in the temple represented? This glassy expanse that um, was God's footstool, but our ceiling. It's interesting when you start down these rabbit holes, <laughs> what you discover. Uh, it's the details matter so much. Okay, so we've talked about the sea a lot. In the Old Testament tabernacle or temple, the priests were required to wash themselves in the sea or the labor. Those words were used synonymously. And it was, um, as a matter of fact, in Solomon's um, labors, there were mirrors. They used mirrors to tile the bottom of the labors. So when the priest bent over the labor to wash before they did the um, servant before they could enter the holy place they had to wash and cleanse they saw a reflection of themselves and even without the mirrors on the bottom um, just seeing your reflection in the water was supposed to uh, imitate us 
examining our lives and looking for places that we need to confess and repent. And so that's all symbolic, that washing. They saw the reflection, realized that they were dirty and they needed washing. It was a daily reminder to wash. And that labor was a giant bowl where all, and some of them in Solomon's time, they, they got in and they bathed. You know, there were like giant hot tubs. They all got in and, and bathed. They washed their feet and their hands and their faces. They, they took a bath. So um, this was all to point towards purity and holiness required to enter into God's presence. And we see, we see that in the tabernacle in the wilderness, and those are the cross-references that you find in Exodus and in 1 Kings in Solomon's temple. So you can chase that down if you want to do further study on the labor. The sea in the Bible can represent three different things, and we've already talked about these in earlier chapters. It can be a large group of people. Remember, the beast came out of the sea in Revelation 13, and so that was a, a picture of him coming out of a sea of people, and it's always a symbol for lost people, for Gentiles. He came out among a large group of lost people. <clears throat> It could also mean the depths of the sea or the deep. Remember in Genesis 1, God separated the waters. You know, his spirit hovered over the deep and then he separated the waters. In the word of God, as the sea was the place that priests washed in the molten sea or labor for cleansing. So we've got three different symbols that it could be. So it appears that when we're talking about this expanse or standing on the sea, the sea could mean the word of God because um, it's the place where, where priests washed and to get clean. And in Ephesians 5.26, it says, Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, that means to cleanse us, having cleansed her by the washing of the water by the word. It's the word that washes us clean. It's the word that reflects whether our behavior is good or evil. It's our rule book, our law. And when we read it, we recognize where we've failed, where we've sinned. So it shows us our sin. It reflects our sin. And then when we confess and repent, we're washed clean. We're cleaned by the blood of Jesus, by the way. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but just so, um, just so you know, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for all our sins, the ones that we haven't even committed yet. Because I've heard teaching that says if you die with any unconfessed sin in your life, that you're going to be held accountable for all that unconfessed sin. Jesus died for our sins. When we stand before Christ, we will be judged for the works that we do in the body for his kingdom. We will not be judged for sin because we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When God the Father looks at us, he sees Jesus. So, I, you know, suicide is a sin. It shows lack of hope or trust in God. But a person who commits suicide does not automatically go to hell. People say, well, they didn't ask forgiveness for that sin. And they, you know, that was the last thing they did was sin. And there was, no, Jesus died for forgiveness of all sin. The ones we haven't committed yet. If we die today and we've got a few months of sins built up, it's fine. We're still covered by the righteousness of Christ. He prefers that we go to the sea and wash to the word of God and wash daily um, so that we are sanctified, so that we're walking in righteousness. But we will not be cast into hell if there's any unconfessed sin in our life. Sarah, you bring that up. My granddaughter asked me that question. My 19-year-old granddaughter asked that question to that Sunday. Usually if I put it if comes up a lot. Do they go to heaven or hell? Right. If their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they go to heaven. Right. 
if they're if it's not then they don't i mean it's black and white but it has nothing to do with committing suicide that is a sin just like gossiping and grumbling and overeating is a sin It's a mental hopelessness. Right. There's a hopelessness there. Yeah. Okay. Just wanted to throw that little tidbit in there in case in case someone ever asks you that question, you can back it up and say, no, Jesus died for all our sins. As long as you're a believer. As long as you're a believer. That's right. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water in which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water now is i mean that's a little and we we how many of you've read second peter all your life you know and never really honed in on what in the world is this talking about but he's talking about the earth being formed out of the water the holy spirit hovered over the deep so the earth was formed out of water and by water. Who was the earth created by? Jesus. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And nothing came into being except by him, the word of God. And so when you see that it's formed out of water and by water, Water then becomes synonymous with the word of God, who is Jesus. Does that make sense? It's a riddle. It, it's like the Trinity. Yeah, it's circular reasoning, you know, and it will fry your brain if you're not careful. But it's something to ponder. It's something to think about. And I would really encourage you, I would underline that in your handout. And someday when you're not, when you have no direction in your Bible study or your quiet time with the Lord, go into his presence and ask him to explain that to you. He promised the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and give us understanding. So try to work that out so that you can, and, and go look at what commentators say about that verse and try to reason what that verse is really saying. He says, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And that's at the great white throne judgment. That's at the end of the thousand year reign. We're going to get to verse two in a minute, I promise. So the sea, it says, um, let's go to verse 2, well, there is no more sea. There's no longer any sea. What does it mean that there's no more sea? Well, it doesn't mean the word of God goes away. That's eternal. Um, it doesn't mean that the sea of glass in heaven goes away. We're standing on it. So, does it mean that the large group of lost people, the Gentiles, go away? And I believe that's what it means. A lot of people want to say, um, and it, it, it does get confusing. If you're thinking a literal ocean, does that mean in heaven that there, you know, the new earth, there's not going to be an ocean and there's not going to be any more dolphins and, you know, octopus and <laughs> whales and all those things, otters, you know, all the things that we like to, to participate in in the ocean. Some people go there and say that's what that means. But if we've got three different symbols that the sea is used for, and here if he's destroying and he says the ungodly men will be gone, it appears that this sea in verse 1, there's no longer any sea, means there's no more large groups of people who are lost. They're gone. No more lost people. They're in the lake of fire. The sea contained the dead. It's where evil came from. And our sea is also needed. Our oceans are needed to, to 
cleanse the air. Um, it's, you know, the salt of the sea purifies the earth. We're not going to need that anymore. Jesus himself will purify the earth. But I really do believe that right here, when it says there's no longer any sea, I think that means there's no more lost people. Okay, the sea in heaven is the word of God. We were seated on the sea. That's the belief that Jesus is the word. And the sea is now gone. We are in the presence of God with no separation anymore. But we're still standing on our belief um, that Jesus is the word. The tribulation saints were standing on the sea. That was the belief in Jesus. And it was mixed with fire. Do y'all remember that? We talked about the... Um, when the tribulation saints came, there was a uh, sea mixed with fire. Well, the fire in heaven was representative of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was in us, the lampstands. Remember that? Um, but the fire also represents testing. And so they were tested by fire through the tribulation and they overcame. So that sea could be... Um, it could be the fire of testing or it could be the Holy Spirit. But the symbols mean things. And I, I can't explain all of them. I just think it's fascinating. Um, they are now in the presence of God with no separation. If the sea is the word of God, then that represents Jesus. And the Holy Spirit represents fire. The tribulation saints have everything that we have. Okay, now we're at verse 2. Yay! Um, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay, this is bizarre because we've been in our new bodies. We've had the marriage supper of the Lamb at the very beginning of the thousand-year reign. And now the new Jerusalem is coming down like a bride adorned for her husband. And then if you go to verse 9, he says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So we see that the, the city is, I mean, that's where we're going to live. The city is the bride of the Lamb. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, that means pay attention. The tabernacle of God is among men. Tabernacle means dwelling place. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. The word God is Elohim. The Trinity will be living among the people in the New Jerusalem. And he will, future tense, in the New Jerusalem, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. So when we hear our funeral um, services that say there's no more crying, no more pain, no more death, not yet. It doesn't happen until the New Jerusalem comes we have seven years in heaven with Jesus. Then we have a thousand years on earth with Jesus. And we're going to see things that will cause us grief and mourning and pain. We are at the great white throne judgment. We're going to see our loved ones resurrected, standing before the throne of God. Good people. We're going to see neighbors that we loved, that we did life with, who were good, generous people, kind-hearted, but did not know Jesus. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's going to be a great day of weeping and mourning. That's going to be a hard day. That's going to be the hardest day in history, I believe. But the good news is that he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will no longer be any death. That means no longer will anybody be separated from God. We're not going to witness anybody else being cast into a lake of fire. And there will no longer be any mourning or crying. Oh, I love that. 
If I cry, I hope they're tears of joy, but there's no more crying. There will no longer be any curse, which means no sickness. If there's a sickness, there's going to be trees for healing. You know, you, there's no curse on the ground. When you think of when God cursed the earth, when he cursed it, then animals turned on each other and started eating one another. The ground brought forth thorns and thistles so that by the sweat of our brow, we, we plant and harvest. In the um, New Jerusalem, we can stick our thumb in the ground and it's going to come up and everyone will have a green thumb. Uh, there will be no more death. That means death of creation as well. You won't kill your orchids anymore. They are, they will thrive. Your African violets will all have greenhouses with everything growing and um, being so fruitful because the first things have passed away. And the tears could be for those that were in outer darkness who had regrets. Remember the whole purpose of the thousand year reign is for those who are in the outer darkness who are believers and enter in, but they have to they're not a part of the celebration. They're outside where it's dark. It's a place of regret. They're going to they're gonna reach this righteousness. They'll no longer be in the outer darkness. When the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth come, nobody will be left out in the darkness. They will have caught up with everyone else. Okay, verse 5. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. The word faithful and true. Remember, that's what was written on the thigh of Jesus Christ. That means that every word he has uttered in his Bible is true. It is faithful. You can count on it. It's the sea of glass you can stand on. It will support you. It will show you truth, uh, truth and lies. It will show you good and evil. It will show you light and darkness. It will give you discernment. Everything you need. It is true. It is faithful. And those are the references in Revelation. Revelation 3.14. Um, Jesus was described as the faithful and true witness. He who sat on the throne in Revelation 19 is called faithful and true. And then um, in Revelation 22, we're going to see a verse that says, He said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, um, I can't remember what the rest of that verse is, but the words of this revelation are faithful and true. And on his thigh is written faithful and true. That's his name. Then in verse 6, and he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. I love this and I can't take uh, credit for knowing this information. Um, but he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Though that's the first letter and the last letter of the um, Greek alphabet. In the Hebrew alphabet, there are 22 letters, and the first letter is called Aleph, and the last letter is called Tau. So if you were reading this in the Hebrew, it would say, I am the Aleph and the Tau, the beginning and the end. In Zechariah 12.10, there's a, a messianic prophecy that says they shall look upon me who they pierced. And this is at the second coming when Jesus goes to Petra and reveals himself to those who are waiting his return. Um, the Alpha and Omega occurs four times in scripture and it's all in Revelation. If you look at the Aleph and the Tau, it's used twice. In, I mean, it's used once in scripture and it's in this scripture and it is let's see if I can it's in Zechariah 12 10 and you remember that Hebrew is read from right to left 
So I printed it out in Hebrew with the translation. So we're going to start on the right side on um, verse 9. And it shall be in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants in Jerusalem the spirit of grace and prayers and they shall look on me and then there's that those two letters that I circled that is an aleph and a tau they shall look on me the beginning and the end, whom they have pierced. So in the translation, in the English translation, we don't see that, but in the original Hebrew text of this passage, that weird Aleph and Tau are in there. And so that shows us in Revelation that he is the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. Yes? Something that's really cool that goes along with this, I have this little book list of Hebrew words, it's kind of like a devotional book written by a Christian. And um, he has MS is the word for faithfulness, and it's made of three letters. And the first letter is alpha, and the last is tau, and the middle one is meth or, or something. So three letters, three Hebrew letters that make up the word faithfulness is the beginning, the first letter, the last letter, and right smack in the dab in the middle. Oh, that's awesome. So that is, it's kind of. So yeah. He, he was always, yeah, he was emphasizing that he, he was, I didn't realize, but it was very pictorial, and mm -hmm. every letter has a really um, full meaning, mm -hmm. and then, so, anyway, I was really, that was really cool. It is, that's really neat, and the, the Hebrew alphabet is also very pictorial, just like Chinese writing is very um, picturesque, you know, every letter or word represents a picture. And um, Hebrew is the same way. In the book of Psalms, we miss it, but one of the um, attributes of Hebrew literature is to write poetry where every letter or every stanza starts with the letter of the alphabet. And some of the Psalms are written that way. I want you to think about it. How many chapters are in the book of Revelation? 22. One for every letter of the alphabet. Um, we, we miss a lot of this in the translation to the English. I can't wait till we know it. And we'll just be able to see it because we'll understand the word of God so much more. Um, if we were Hebrew, if we knew Hebrew and Greek, it would just open up a whole new world to us. But we're, we're limited in our, in our knowledge. We're doing the best we can with what we have. So let's look at Psalm 119. Um, this is one of the Psalms where every section is labeled by a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And Psalm 119.1 starts the section and it is labeled Aleph, which is the first letter of the alphabet. And that verse says, how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. That's the word the sea of glass and then the Tau this is the last section of Psalm 119 begins like this let my cry come near before thee O Lord give me understanding according to your word let my supplication come before you deliver me according to your word let my lips utter praise for you teach me your statutes and this just seems like the summing up of all things, like what we're talking about in Revelation. In the beginning was the Word, and then in the end, we, just, we get to live eterni in eternity with the Word. Okay, verse 6. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. So if we turn to Revelation 22, we see a description of his throne, and it says, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So what I envision here is 
The vision in Ezekiel, the, the expanse or the crystal sea was over the heads. Then in Revelation, we see we're standing on the crystal sea, and now I see it melted. Now I see it's gone. Now it is flowing. It is, it's no longer a crystal sea or a floor. It's, it's no longer solid. It is now in liquid form. It is the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Y'all see that progression? So those are my questions. That's what I'm thinking. That's my interpretation. I don't know if anybody else in the world, I did not consult any commentaries on this. So, uh, you know, see what others might say, but we're no longer standing on it. It has passed away uh, with the, the heaven and the earth. And it's now flowing like a river from the throne of God. It also serves as life giving water to the nations. The nations who are still in their physical bodies can come to the river of life and drink as often as they want to drink. Is that where we are right now? Right now, this is our crystal city. And we can come to it anytime we want, without cost. We can come to the Word of God. We can approach, if Jesus is the Word, we can come before Jesus in the Holy of Holies anytime we want. He lives, if we are the temple of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us wherever we are. The Holy of Holies is inside of us. It's in the midst of us. And so we can come to the living water at any time without cost. So they'll have to physically do it. We can spiritually do it anytime. It's one of the benefits of living in the church age and being the bride of Christ. A whole different, a whole different category, a whole different world. Okay, verse 7. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So all during the Old Testament, God promised that Israel would be his people. And now he, and he always referred to Jesus as his son. But now he's saying, he who overcomes. Okay, we're talking about those overcomers through the millennial. Because the overcomers through the tribulation are, are with us, right? They're in their glorified bodies. He's talking here about the survivors, his nation Israel. And now he has a personal relationship with them. They will be a son to him. So they will enjoy the same intimacy with God as we do. He lives inside of us. They will have to go to the New Jerusalem to see God. But they can anytime they want. They can go anytime they want. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire, that, um, lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So they will be with their father, the devil, forever. They will be cast into the lake of fire. So that's a jump back to looking at. The fact that all the wicked are in the lake of fire now for eternity and we're in a new season, the New Jerusalem. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So we're now married. We've been called the bride of Christ all through the New Testament. We have seven years with him in the honeymoon. And then we come back down for the marriage feast and we live with him as kings and priests throughout the thousand year reigns. And now he's going to show us the bride, the wife of the lamb. Then verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy, what did I say? The Holy City. Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. So when he says the heavens and the earth passed away, he's talking about that first and second heaven 
the, the first heaven is where the birds fly and the airplanes are. The second heaven is outer space where the stars, the moon, and the sun are. All of that has passed away. But the third heaven, the throne room of God, still exists because right here, the holy city comes down from there. So I want you to think about the, what Jesus said before he left. In John 14, I believe, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. In my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms. These are dwelling places. And when we compare that to the Jewish, uh, the traditional Jewish marriage ceremony, after the proposal, the son went back to his father's house and added on a room or living quarters for he and his bride. And when his father thought it was finished and acceptable, he would instruct the son, okay, it is done, go get your bride. So think about that, that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. It will be held in escrow for a thousand years, a thousand and seven years. It is in heaven. He's building it now. But when the new city comes down, it's coming out of heaven, and this is our dwelling place. This is our mansion that's coming down, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Um, and having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of clear, uh, a crystal clear jasper. So it looks like a diamond. The city looks like a diamond. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. So this is interesting. I wrote down the 12 tribes of Israel as they were listed the first time in Scripture. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Sometimes Dan is missing and Joseph is divided into Manasseh and Ephraim. So be aware of that. Uh, those names are manipulated sometimes, but this is, these are all 12 sons of Jacob. I mean, yeah. Verse 13, there were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. So this is not some symbolic temple. He's given us very specific uh, directions here. So we know this is a literal city coming down. It parallels the camp of Israel that we were given in the New Testament. And I put a, a smiley face there. Notice that Peter is not mentioned at any of the gates. There are, There is an angel at every gate. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So they are our foundation. That's what the, the church was built on, were those 12 apostles that Jesus called, and the church was built on that foundation, that rock. And Jesus was the cornerstone. So it's interesting to me that the gates are, are the... Um, the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, the stones are the 12 tribes, I mean the 12 apostles. It's fascinating to me how some people um, try to imagine what this looks like. I don't know, it's not clear from scripture, whether the 12 stones was a solid slab of, what are they, ruby? I don't know what they all are yet. I will see it in a minute, but is it a solid slab, 12 layers tall that's the foundation? Or since every gate is one of the 12 tribes, is every foundation stone also aligned with one of the tribes? So that when you look at it, there's only one foundation, but this corner is a ruby, this corner is a sapphire, this corner is jasper. Yeah, so we'll see some pictures of that in a minute. The 12 apostles were Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, 
Thomas, Matthew, James, Thaddeus, Simeon, and Judas. It will be interesting. A lot of people say Judas will not be there because he rejected Christ. He turned over Christ, but I believe he was extremely remorseful. Um, the fact that he committed suicide showed that he was distraught. And Jesus looked at him and says, do what you need to do. It was prophesied ahead of time. He was chosen and appointed ahead of time to betray Jesus. So I don't think that was the unforgivable sin. It was a sin, but it's not an unforgivable sin. And so personally, I believe Judas is going to be there. It'll be, I don't know that he gets his name on a foundation stone. It will probably be Matthias. Was that who? Or, that um, replaced him. Oh, and let me just say, I heard a commentator uh, this week mention that Matthias was not chosen by God, that he was chosen by Lot. Uh, let me just say that God is God of the lots. Everywhere in the Old Testament, the way they judged guilt and innocence was someone had to reach into a bag with uh, three black stones and a white stone. So the chances of pulling out the black stones meant guilty, the white stone meant innocent. God directed and revealed innocence and guilt. It was not by chance. I mean, the chances of reaching in and pulling out that white rock are slim. But because God is God of the lots, then if you were innocent, you really would pull out the white rock rock every time the white stone if you were innocent because God is in control of all that when they cast lots for Jesus's clothes at the cross God was in charge of who won those lots um, he it's not by chance it, it's not by chance and when you look at the Old Testament and see how people were judged you recognize that God directed who would be chosen the disciple to replace Judas so just keep that in mind. Verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with a rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. So it's 1,500 wide by 1,500 long by 15. 1500 tall that's pretty amazing 1500 miles miles it is a cubed shape and when you unroll a cube it's the shape of a cross Fascinating. we live in three dimensions right now when we are in our glorified bodies we will live in additional dimensions we, physical walls will not stop us. We'll be able to pass through walls. We'll be able to transport ourselves with a thought. Um, so we'll be living in a different dimension that we don't really understand right now. Our bodies will be able to do things that um, we can't even comprehend right now. This is a visual of the new Jerusalem coming down it, it's a little more gold in this picture. If you look at the next picture, that's more accurate on the left because it looks more like a diamond shape. Clear as crystal. The picture on the right, um, I like because you can see the 12 gates. And is that the one where you can see the 12? No, not yet. Okay, here's one that had every foundation stone is a solid slab. And so there were 12 foundations. Then the next picture does the same thing, 12 foundations, but you see the angels at every gate. I like that. So in verse 17, he says he measured its wall, 22 yard, I mean 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. So he just kind of throws that in there. As a, oh, and by the way, they're the same as angelic measurements, which is interesting, but that's just a bit of trivia that you now know. So I did some, and that, um, 
try to compare and visualize this. I'm a football fan, so I use a football field to show you how far 72 yards is. So you can see the 72 yards. Um, that is 216 feet tall. That would be how tall the wall of the city is. Now the city itself is 1,500 miles tall, but the wall, we're just talking about the wall where the pearly gates are, um, is 216 feet tall. The Empire State Building is there and where the orange line is, you can see that's 216 feet. So if you've ever been to the um, Empire State Building, you can see how many floors tall the wall of the city is. The material of the wall was jasper. Karen, can I just say something? I did math on that one. Because uh -huh. you're a math teacher. Um, and the 72 yards is 144 cubits is what we were told. Uh -huh. And um, 12 is the square root of 144. Of 144. That's right. That's kind of interesting. So that means the 12, I mean the, yeah. So there'll be 12 yeah. cubits at every, at all the 12 gates. Okay, did I read all that? Okay, so the material um, of the wall was jasper and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. None of us have ever seen pure gold that's so pure it's clear as glass. That's more than 24 karat gold. I think that's 100 karat gold. <laughs> it's perfect gold. It is holy, 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 and it is clear as glass. Um, and Jasper is like the, the diamond. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. And then it gives us the names of the stones. But something interesting is that when you trace the names of the stones, they, you can't trace them back very far because um, when Babylon changed everything, when they came into world power, um, they polluted all of the history. And so now we don't have, um, there's dispute of what name goes with which stone and what color they are. And there's all variations, uh, even within the same uh, stone. I mean, with, you can say diamond, but there's yellow diamonds and pink diamonds and um, all shades of diamonds. And so it's that way within every rock. So we're not sure what the exact colors are. The first foundation stone was jasper. We think that's like a diamond. The second was sapphire. We think that's blue. We're pretty sure it's blue. The third was uh, chalcedony. The fourth was emerald. The fifth was sardonyx. The sixth sardius. The seventh chrysolite. The eighth beryl. The ninth topaz. The tenth chrysoprase the 11th Jason and the 12th Amethyst. So in Exodus 28, God directed Moses and said, you shall make a breast piece of judgment, the work of a skillful workman. It shall be square and folded double, a span in length and a span in width. You shall mount it on four rows of stones. So the, breast, uh, the priest wore a breastplate over their linen robe and it was called the breastplate of the priest and it had the names of the 12 tribes uh, four rows of three they had to be in a certain order and each tribe had their own stone that was associated with it and so these were um, the first row shall be a row of ruby topaz and emerald the second row turquoise sapphire and diamond the third row jason uh, agate, amethyst, the fourth row, beryl, onyx, and jasper, and they shall be set in gold filigree. The stones shall be according to the names of the sons of Israel. So we're seeing a pattern in the breastplate of the priest in the city of the New Jerusalem. Twelve, according to their names, they shall be like the engravings of a seal, each according to his name for the twelve tribes. So we can't validate the stones. We believe that the rabbis do know the, the ones that are mentioned in the breastplate so that when they get ready to rebuild the temple, those things are ready to go. Um, what we think, these are 
you can look at that chart and see what we think the colors are right now. That's the closest that we can get to it. And then there are three different pictures that I found and they all have them different. They're all different. <laughs> Everybody has a different opinion. So we can't really be sure, but I'm trusting that God will reveal to the rabbis exactly what they need to be in compliance in the tribulation temple. Verse 21, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So now we're standing not on the blue, the crystal sea, uh, the expanse that was blue in appearance. It was clear like ice, but it was, it, it appeared like sapphire. It was reflecting the heaven. What are we reflecting now? Gold. We're reflecting the light because there's no darkness of heaven anymore. There's no blue sapphire night sky. So now um, it's pure gold, like transparent glass, and that's what we walk on, and it's still the word of God. Interesting that the gates that are named for the 12 tribes of Israel are pearls because they're not kosher. They were considered unclean. Jewish people were not allowed to eat oysters. They come from the sea. The sea represents the lost, the Gentiles, right? This is the only remnant of the sea that we have in heaven. Pearls grow in response to irritation. So it's a thing of adornment that begins because of strife or tribulation. So I just want you to think about this. If you're Jewish and you're a survivor, you're one of the survivors in your earthly bodies, and to go into the presence of God, to get into the city, you have to go through this Gentile symbol. That's humbling. Is that not humbling? It's a constant reminder that God chose Israel first. Israel rejected the Messiah. So he grafted us an unnatural branch into the vine and we grew in order to make Israel jealous. And now Israel turning to Jesus and calling on him as Messiah is grafted back. They were cut off. They were cut off at that time. Now they're grafted back into the vine as we are and how much more fruitful they will be because they are of the original vine. And now they have to walk through that pearl gate as a reminder. It's all about grace. They rejected him, but God's grace has brought them back and they have to go through that pearl gate. So the temple is the dwelling place of God. The whole city is the dwelling place of God. And we are living there. It's like going beyond the veil and living in the Holy of Holies forever. We are never out of God's uh, presence. And when we get to chapter 22, the things that we're going to see, y'all, are going to be amazing. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. That doesn't mean there's no darkness or night outside the city. It means there's no darkness inside the city, because if God is there, the light's on all the time. We don't have need of sleep in our new bodies. There's no night. There's no sleep, unless you want to sleep. Uh, but outside the gate, there still will be, we know there will be sun and moon and stars because uh, they are still working. They are still working. There are still seasons. There are, um, we'll see that next week. The glory of God is limited. The lamp is its lamb. The the glory of God coming from that city is enough to illumine the whole earth so that their earth can be fruitful. 
The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of earth will bring their glory into it. So whatever the first fruits of everything that they put their hands to outside the city, they will bring into the new Jerusalem with them. They're still in their earthly bodies. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, there means not in eternity, it means in the new Jerusalem. There's no night in the new Jerusalem where we're living. Its gates will never be closed. The nations can come in anytime they want, um, just as we can enter the presence of God anytime we want. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. The city will contain the glory of God the Almighty and the Lamb and the nations. So remember that glory means the correct value to something, the correct estimate of something. And nothing unclean and no one who practices abominations and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The nations still have free choice. They, they still have free will, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. But their, land, their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. When, when God said all Israel will be saved, after that great white throne judgment, everyone that, that proceeds into eternity, their name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That includes the survivors that are in their earthly bodies. And that's why the demons were all cast into the lake of fire because their names are not in the Lamb's Book of Life. They can't be, they have no capacity to be saved because they're half angel, half human. Okay. All things are made new. The nations are walking as Adam and Eve walked in the garden. They do have free will, but they cannot come into the city if they lie or practice abomination or are unclean. But there, if they do that, there is a way to confess and repent and to get right. And they will because they will want to come into the city. So we live in the Holy of Holies in the New Jerusalem, the nations are welcome to come beyond the veil through those pearly gates into the Holy of Holies anytime they want, and they're going to bring their glory, the glory of their work, into the city. So just wait till you see chapter 22. Um, we have access to the Holy of Holies right now because Jesus tore the veil. Oh, and look how I wrote into, I'm sorry, in T-W-O. Uh, okay. Um, the question for us in application is, do we access him, or are we too busy serving him? Do we do all the work of the ministry, but we don't ever just sit at his feet and listen to him? So, in the temple, the priest had to um, take care of the lampstand, put the incense on the prayer altar, uh, they had to bake the bread and eat the bread every day. They had to sacrifice the animals. And so in the same way, those things were symbolic of us reading and studying the word. That's the daily bread. Um, praying, interceding for others, interceding for ourselves is on the prayer altar. Um, we're to walk by the spirit. That was the, what the lampstand represented. And to be continually filled with the oil, be refreshed and renewed every day by the Holy Spirit. And then going beyond the veil means sitting at the feet of Jesus and just listening to him. Not doing anything, just abiding in his presence. And why do we do all that? So that we won't be part of the outer darkness, so that we won't have any regret. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who doth not be ashamed of accurately handling the word of truth. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. The word of truth is the sea of glass we're standing on, remember? So let your light so shine 